While most of us know The Witcher from the best-selling video game trilogy, it actually began as a best-selling Polish book series. The books are written by fantasy writer Andrzej Sapkowski and has become vastly popular, especially within Poland. The Witcher would first be adopted into a video game in 1996 by a small Polish video game developer known as Metropolis, but the project was never completed as it turned out to be too ambitious and a few screenshots, documents and articles is all that remains. However, before Metropolis started developing this game, there was no English translation of the Polish title of the books, so Metropolis is actually responsible for coining the English title The Witcher. In the early 2000s, the Polish video game distribution company CD Projekt decided that they wanted to develop a game of their own based on the Witcher book series. The author soon accepted the company's proposal and development swiftly began. However, the company was in for a challenge as they had no idea of how to actually make a video game. They started by forming the game development division CD Projekt Red, and in 2002 they had produced a top-down style game as a demonstration to potential publishers. The demo was a complete failure, so they were forced to start from scratch. Two years went by, and then at E3 2004 they had a new demo, and this time the game was a success. But it would still be another three years until its release in the fall of 2007, because CD Projekt Red were still learning how to make a video game. Ideas began to spiral out of control and even though they cut large portions of the game, they still ended up with over 100 hours of gameplay. In their own words, the game was a total mess and just at the very end it all came together. Initially they had predicted that around 15 people would be required to create a game of this caliber, but instead it took over 100 people 5 years to make. The Witcher was finally released in October of 2007, and while not being an enormous hit right away, it was far from a failure. So CD Projekt Red immediately began development of a second installment. After overcoming some major setbacks with development of a console version of the first Witcher game, as well as creating their own in-house game engine, The Witcher 2 Assassins of Kings was released in May of 2011. This time, the game was a major hit and became a critical and commercial success all over the world. From the very beginning though, the company planned on making a trilogy, so after the success of The Witcher 2, they began development of its sequel. And in May of 2015, The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt was released and has since become their most successful game by far. Because of the success of the Witcher franchise, a movie adaptation is in the works based on the novels and will be released in 2017. Please don't suck, please don't suck, please don't suck. If the movie turns out to be successful, a continuation is planned in the form of a TV show. But all of this has actually happened before. In 2001, a Polish movie adaptation was released with the international title The Hexer. It sucks, it sucks, it sucks. And it was soon followed by a Polish TV show of the same name in 2002. Both received extremely poor reviews and deviated quite a bit from the source material. For example, Vesemir's role is replaced by a character simply known as Old Witcher, or I guess Old Hexer in this case, while Vesemir himself is presented as a druid. The Witcher games are completely filled with easter eggs and references, so here's at least a few of the more prominent and interesting. During the prologue in The Witcher 2, you can find a dead body in a typical white Assassin's Creed outfit amongst some stacks of hay. It's implied that the Assassin died by failing to perform the classic Leap of Faith maneuver, and you can even see a platform at the top of the tower similar to those often used in the Assassin's Creed games. When you approach the body, you even receive a new ability, simply called Assassin. In the Mines of Vatigan in The Witcher 2, you can find a body that holds a note. The note reveals that an ancient evil has been awakened and then ends with the line Fly, you fools! This is a very clear reference to The Lord of the Rings, not only because of the note's content, but it was written by a dwarf named Balin, just like a dwarf also named Balin left a book in the Mines of Moria in The Lord of the Rings. In the first Witcher game, the character Eskel mentions a gnome known as Alfred Nabel. Ever heard of the gnome Alfred Nabel? Through years of research, he discovered an amazing substance. He intended it for use in mines and quarries. Though a genius, 
Alfred failed to foresee his invention's possible applications. Others quickly realized that a substance designed to rip granite from the ground could destroy castle walls. Some even considered using it in open battle. This is all in reference to Alfred Nobel, who invented dynamite and later deeply regretted doing so as he had not foreseen its use on battlefields as a means of killing. At the small Isle of Ker Almhult in The Witcher 3, you can find these sky cells. In one of them lies the body of Tyron Lannister from the TV show Game of Thrones. At the graveyard in Lindenvale in The Witcher 3, it's possible to spot a few statues. There's nothing strange about that until you turn around and notice that the statues actually change positions when you're not looking. This is in reference to weeping angels from the TV show Doctor Who, which behave in much the same way. In The Witcher 2, there's a quest titled Hung Over, in which Geralt wakes up with a tattoo on his neck. To get the tattoo removed, he has to complete a few objectives first. But this is all optional, so the player can actually choose to keep the tattoo if they want to. Now, the Witcher games also have a rather interesting feature in that you can import completed save files from previous installments. This means that if you import a save file from The Witcher 2 into The Witcher 3, the choices you made in The Witcher 2 will have some minor effects on the story of The Witcher 3. So depending on your decision during this quest in The Witcher 2, Geralt may still have the tattoo on his neck in The Witcher 3. Ever since the release of the second game, the series have gathered a huge fanbase across the globe. But as the game developer is from Poland, the entire in-game universe was inspired by European and Slavic mythology. The games have become an even greater sensation in Poland itself. For example, in 2011, when the US president made an official visit to meet up with Poland's prime minister, the Polish prime minister offered a gift which included, among other things, a copy of The Witcher 2 Assassins of Kings. The US president later made a comment regarding the gift, saying it was a great example of Poland's place in the global economy. Uh, in fact, the last time I was here, uh, Donald gave me a gift. Uh, the video game developed here in Poland that's won fans uh, the world over, uh, The Witcher, a great example of Poland's uh, place in the new global economy. Also in 2011, the character Tris Marigold made an appearance on the front cover of Playboy magazine in Poland. The photos from the magazine and the real-life photoshoot behind them were later included in The Witcher 2 Enhanced Edition. And while it's difficult to tell at first, if you look really, really closely, you'll find some fantastic character development on the left nipple. Many times when I make a video, it can be quite difficult to find 10 facts I personally deem to be interesting enough, but not this time. These games, especially The Witcher 3, are so full of minor details that will escape so many players. But as many of them are quite minor, I decided to compile the most interesting into one single section. In the woods near Kermorhen, you'll find a grave with a sword in it. Leo's grave. A senseless death could have been avoided. Leo was a witcher who died at the beginning of the first witcher game. Vesemir, Leo is dead. When Geralt sheathes his swords, he uses his free hand to push the bottom of the scabbard away from his body so as to make it easier to slide the sword in. During the quest Princess in Distress, you'll encounter a bear and have to defeat it to progress. But if you seek out and slay the bear prior to the quest, Geralt actually mentions this. There, around this area. Good thing I ran into him earlier. In a similar fashion, during the quest Ladies of the Wood, you're tasked with retrieving a bottle from a bird's nest. Something's on the ledge? Something that'll get you your voice back? Guess I gotta make this climb. If this is accomplished beforehand, Geralt is aware of this as well. Something's on the ledge? Something that'll get you your voice back? Ah, the bottle from the nest. Already got it. During the quest King's Gambit, a woman is sentenced to death in a very specific way. You will be chained to a rock 
to perish of hunger and thirst, and sea fowl will peck apart your remains. Once the quest is over, her body can be found exactly as described on a remote island. Not far from the city of Novigrad, there's a place known as the Seven Cats Inn. If you take a look around, you'll actually find seven cats. By timing it just right, you can actually use the art sign to deflect incoming arrows. During the quest Trial of Grasses in The Witcher 3, there's a deleted sequence in which Geralt has to cook a meal for Jennifer. Can't be any harder than brewing a potion. A bit of this, a bit of that, mix it all together. Don't have any onion. Scrambled eggs. It's gotta be. So, uh, do I spoon feed you? Would you prefer to watch me eat without my hands? You could find it amusing, I suppose. Right. One for Papa Vesemir. In much of the promotional material for The Witcher 3, Geralt is shown carrying a set of uniquely designed steel and silver swords. In fact, they've become quite unique symbols for the game at this point. But for some reason, these items are not accessible to the player in the final game and were instead repurposed and used by other characters. For example, the steel sword is used by some of the guards from the Eternal Fire. But of course, on PC, there are mods which enables you to use the two swords if you really want to. The Witcher 3 was originally intended to include a feature which allowed Geralt to fight monsters on ice while ice skating. See the fun and fantasy come to life when Geralt on ice presents worlds of enchantment. It would have been a sort of extension to his already dance-like fighting style, but at a faster pace. The reason this feature was later abandoned was because it had to be introduced very late into the game's story, and introducing new game mechanics at the very end just didn't work that well, apparently. But I mean, they, they fully redeemed themselves by including this amazing SSX of Rivia minigame. <laughs> If you haven't read the books and maybe only played the latest Witcher game, it can be quite overwhelming to understand what's going on at times. The universe these games are based upon is just incredibly expansive with many centuries of history behind them. The games take place within two regions known as the Northern Kingdoms and the Nilfgaardian Empire, which in turn exist on a continent simply known as the Continent. More than a millennium before the events of the books and games, this place was inhabited by the Elder Races, which included Elves, Dwarves and Gnomes. But suddenly, a cataclysmic event known as the Conjunction of the Spheres caused parallel universes to collide and thus unnatural creatures like ghouls, drowners, vampires, etc. became stranded on the continent. It was also around this time that humans first began to appear and is known as the First Landing. Many centuries and devastating wars later, humankind would eventually conquer the continent and treat all non-humans as absolute garbage. The conflict between humans and non-humans is a common theme throughout the games and books. However, the numerous creatures from other dimensions made it quite difficult and dangerous to inhabit this vast landscape. So humans created witchers. A witcher is someone who has undergone ruthless experimentation, training and conditioning ever since childhood for the sole purpose of becoming an expert at hunting and killing monsters. This resulted in them becoming sterile, gaining incredible speed, strength, endurance and reflexes, having the ability to use magic in the form of signs, immunity against diseases, accelerated healing, vastly increased lifespans and cute little cat eyes. Kawaii. Witcher successfully eradicated most of the monsters across the Northern Kingdoms and the Nilfgaardian Empire and everyone was happy. But now that most of the monsters were gone, there wasn't really a need for witchers anymore. This, coupled with their superhuman abilities, eventually transformed the once celebrated witchers into feared and resented outcasts. Fast forward to the time of the books and games, witchers are now few and far in between, with the most skilled and legendary being our protagonist, Geralt of Rivia. The love of his life is Jennifer of Wengenberg, a powerful sorceress, and together they adopt and train a girl named Cyrilla, or Ciri. 
Siri possessed a rather unique ability to travel between different dimensions. Five years before the events of the first game, Geralt and Jennifer actually dies, but are soon revived and rescued by Siri as she takes them to an island known as the Isle of Avalon. As soon as I had left you and Yen on the Isle of Avalon, I found myself pursued. Eredin and his Red Riders were on my heels. After Geralt and Jennifer have spent some time on the island to recover, the Wild Hunt suddenly appear and kidnaps Jennifer. The Wild Hunt is part of a powerful ancient elven race from another world who seeks Ciri's ability to travel between dimensions. Geralt chases after the Wild Hunt to rescue Jennifer, and once he finally finds her, the only way to save her life is to make a deal with the King of the Wild Hunt. His soul for that of Jennifer's. Left with no other choice, Geralt goes with the Wild Hunt and Jennifer is freed. Geralt spends some quality time with the Wild Hunt only to ambiguously return five years later with a serious case of amnesia looking like he just left the grave. Oh, you look like you just left your grave. This is when the first Witcher game kicks off. He soon reunited with another sorceress named Triss Merigold, and because he can't remember anything, including Jennifer, he falls in love with Triss. Geralt continues to struggle with remembering his past until finally doing so at the end of the second game. With his restored memory, he sets out to find Jennifer at the start of The Witcher 3.